All right. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for coming out today and welcome to the launch of Kipuka, Finding Refuge in Times of Change, Bamboo Ridge Issue 119. Uh, my name is Don Karaching. I'm a local fiction writer here in Hawaii. I helped to edit this issue along with Brenda Kwan, Meredith Adesha Enos, and Misty Lynn Sanico. Uh, this is a very special issue. We started on the issue in 2019, and it rose out of a need to reflect on and consider life in contemporary Hawaii and the various challenges, challenges facing the communities here. And uh, this central question, if nothing is static and everything changes, in what can we anchor? Shortly after we began work on the issue, COVID-19 hit, and we were faced with numerous crises, new, old, and ongoing, and still are facing many of these. So we continued to accept submissions in order to provide a platform for the poems, stories, and voices that were coming in. This issue covers many areas and themes, including colonialism, demilitarization, loss, grief, climate change, Mauna Kea, water rights, immigration, and cultural identity. Language is also heavily featured, including work in Pidgin and Olo Hawaii. And it also features four contemporary artists, Nanea Lum, Makai Tubbs, Wooden Wave, and Corey Tom. This issue also features a, a diverse collection of authors and artists emerging and established, many of whom are new to Bamboo Ridge. And I'm so happy to have four of those authors here with us today. And so we will begin. And uh, the way that we'll do the session is we'll have each of the authors read today. And then at the end, uh, we'll have some time for questions and answers and, and talk story. Um, all right, so we're going to begin with uh, Joanna. So I'll go ahead and, and read your bio, Joanna, and we'll get started. All right. Uh, Joanna Gordon is a writer from the gentrified swamplands of East Honolulu. She is a first year PhD candidate studying storytelling and rhetoric at Indiana University and has degrees from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and Western Washington University. Her poems and prose have been published with Cherry Tree, The Tenderness Project, Blood Tree Literature, The Shore, Oxford Press, Nimrod, and more. Her poems are interested in notions of belonging, joy, settler colonialism, and more. In her spare time, Joanna enjoys scalding cups of coffee, hiking, bright lipstick, and the company of great friends. Aloha, everybody. Um, I thank you for joining us today. Um, like Donald said, I'm coming from Indiana. So actually, it should be good evening because it is 10 o'clock here. Um, <laughs> I will be sharing a couple poems with you guys today. Um, I just wanted to take a small second to kind of like situate where these poems are coming from. Uh, I wrote a lot of these poems in my first two years of living on the mainland. I was, you know, born and raised in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, we always know that we were going to go mainland at some point, but I wasn't really prepared for what that would look like or what that would be or how that would feel. And I think with these poems, I was kind of searching to find the voices that I heard growing up and bring them with me, bring them to the mainland, bring them as like, you know, as strength and as remembrance and finding ways for me to situate myself with my culture as, you know, not a Kanaka Maoli, but someone who has ties still to the land and still to where we come from and wants to honor that and pay attention to that. So. I just want to situate where I am in terms of where these poems came from. A lot of sad nights in my apartment. Um, but uh, I'll start with this poem. It's called A Glossary for a Storm. And it features a bunch of different words that I just kind of kept coming back to. I wrote, I'll start now. Glossary for a storm. Fish, noun. Place two crabs in a bucket to see what she must become to survive. In the after, she is more gill than breath, more laughter than heart, two chambers instead of four, always preparing for a gust of wind to become a storm. Ghost, noun. A conjuring that comes from a damaged body, a reconfiguration of the living, a desire that becomes a damage or what licks its fingers, bites its own nails, swallows stones, in the face of reconciliation, she will spit out her own tongue, a refusal to stop its own form of resolving. Girl, verb, pulled from weeds, still blooming, smelt and eaten with salt and vinegar, stuck between snaggletooth rocks, coveted, curated, traveled, remade from plastic, 
classified by size, arranged, made public, sold, made wild again, melted down to metal shanks, revenged, avenged, wrecked, wrought, weighed, wanted, a desire yet to be seen. Holy noun. The cleaving between settler and haunting, the shadow passing over the freeway on a clear day, a curse hitching a ride to old Pali Road, repelled by blood and raw pua'a. What visits for two days, for five days, for a month, a romanticized fantasy, a sunburnt menace, the none otherwise specified body, a halflander or pale skin chasing tradition. Haunt, verb, to echo, to scare yourself back into skin, a slick groan, a story that is your mother's too, a single beat, the time it takes for a body to splinter, a ritual of holding breath at night, when you wipe down the counters with bleach and his blood. For example, I don't want to haunt you, but I already have. Home, noun. A roughness between Malka and Makai, between rock and a foreign place, like the crushed plastic run smooth, like what gets left out on the beach, Jimmy Boy's slipper and a few beer cans, what the ocean swallows or spits out. Like if you place a rock on the shoreline and it does not get washed away, what remains? Island, noun. A geographically isolated body, a single storm blowing shrill, like a plastic whistle, a belly that feeds mountains, the nene bird flying east to west, a concrete mouth, a gasoline river traveling from valley to sea, a city of immigrants, a city of refugees, a city with missing natives trapped inside a can of rusted spam. Mercy, verb. Once during a tsunami advisory, my sister and I hiked to the top of Cocoa Head Crater with binoculars and watched the tides suck on the wind. It kind of looked like pulling the lips back to reveal a set of teeth. And still, when our parents asked, what did you see? All we could say was water, which is to say to become the first breath before a storm the gift a ghost grants you, even if it's not really a gift, but just the illusion of it. Origin, noun, of daughter, of sister, of mother, of nuclear family, of homeland we do not visit, born from wine, bathed in chicken broth, raised among pencil shavings, of typewriter dust, of mango, the romance in coconut surf wax, of ashes buried in the backyard, of the things that I never met, never held, of holding space for a stillness, a way of being of you and so also of me. Sex, adjective. Once he took me without warning. Once he took me without reason. I searched the hook of my body for answers. For months I pulled him and each other man from me. A spool of silk nets, I tangled them into knots around my fingers a web yes uh-huh please stop no thank you no i pulled my consent from my body and knitted song after song um that is the first one um so the next one i'll be reading <laughs> i'm just gonna do a couple because that one was a long boy um <laughs> so the next one is called waiting for rain Mom still hangs her laundry out to dry, slip was ankle deep in suckling grass. Dad cleans the rain gutters, pulling out the soggy plumeria leaves by hand. The girl fingers the pages in their books restlessly. Why can't we make a slip and slide, they whine. The dog wags its tail, hoping the sliding door will squeak open while auntie who lives at the bus stop huddles under her tarp house for warmth. Tomorrow, the mountain will melt its shoulders sliding downhill and together in the rain, we will all choke on mud. Um, the next one I'm going to read is Have the Fish. 
Save the Woman. Uh, this is not in the Kapuka selection, but uh, it was a big part of what I was thinking about and written all in the same kind of like storm that I was thinking about. Um, this is called Have the Fish Save the Woman. Having swallowed a spore of sea, grass grown a tail thin, gaining an inch for each bloody month, each breaking, having slathered her skin with algae spit, wrapped her shoulders in river muck, mud from mangroves, dried snail shells and pickled squid tails. Having grown her first slitted gill all wrong, crumpled and fluttering in her armpit, scales sprouting from ingrown hairs and curled into fingernails. Having too eaten an eel raw, just to see how her death tastes with lime, a dash of soy sauce thrown back with a bit of vodka sugar around the rim, having learned to swim in dizzying circles, giggle, spit up salt water, send a spray of blood clots or just the spitting wind, having been told to swallow the entire ocean, a basin of salt to lick the silt beneath her scales to eat, eat, to never be eaten again. Um, the last one I'm going to read, it will be a quick one. So I'm sorry if I'm going over time, Donald. Um, this one is called Another Type of After. Mountains bleed when a storm shakes houses down our backs. Dirt floods spitting up slippers down the street, far back and deep into the valley. If it continues to rain, we will wake tomorrow with mud in our mouths instead of spit. And still all we smell is salt rising from the concrete, a thick sigh lying still through the, through the streets. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you so, so much, Joanna, sorry. Um, it's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're gonna have a little bit of a change in our, our order. Uh, uh, we have uh, one of our, our panelists today is, is, is gonna join us uh, soon, but so we're gonna move to uh, Niall. Uh, Niall Simmons is a queer writer and performer with a degree in English from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Writing from the diaspora as a Maui a, a poet born and raised away from Aotearoa, New Zealand, her work digs into such themes as diaspora, identity conflict, and home. Her work has been featured in Public Journal, Flux Hawaii, Contemporary Verse, Taya Literary Magazine, Hawaii Review, and Ora Nui. Um. Kia ora, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Donald, for the intro. And um, just Joanna's so good. And um, she's one of my best friends, and I love her so much. Um, so I have two poems in this uh, Kipuka collection. Um, uh, the first, uh, they both kind of, um, relate to similar things, but the first one I think um, has a lot to do with learning to find refuge um, and a sense of home and belonging despite like all the things thrown at me um, as it does work Māori. Um, and then the last one is, is the same thing, but um, is learning to find it in um, the most unexpected place, I think to find belonging, which is in town and in the city and in urban spaces. Um, sorry about the motorcycle. Um, okay, so uh, this first one um, is called Other People. And it's kind of like a back and forth between me and things that have been told to me throughout my life. Um, okay. Come home, go home. The only way to connect is by being at home. Well, then will you pay for my ticket? Get me on a plane every time I need it. Or will you find the tree? Teach me to carve and shape the waka. Show me how we used to move between motsu, glide with it, 
hoi 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 ara like korota with it all the way back to te tairawhitine. You should learn the real. Kao, korero i te reo Māori, girl. You can make time for the real, no excuses. So you're spotting the fees for the lessons then? Shut, bro, you topping up my hop card as well since I'm probably busting it to all these wānanga. How about when I want to practice? Will you practice with me? Or am I too tame enough for you? Will you promise to hold me when Matsua shames me in the marae? Get me a brand new blackened tongue since mine is too bleached. Blood, blood, blood. Yeah, about that one. I don't remember where I put mine. Can I borrow yours, sis? Can you show me again how deep I'm supposed to dig? How much of the guts I need to show and how to put them all back in again when done? Will you send me the papers for the land after? For belonging? Will this hurt my future children as badly as it hurts their mother? Ko hikurangi te manga, ko waiapu te awa, ko te ihi. How often have you sent uemuku just for me? How can I smell your smoky morning all the way from Hawaii? When I finally make it up the manga, will you hold the sun for me? Why did it take me so long to open to you? To see you in the sky, the street, music, my smile, and how silly it'd be to ever let go after all of that. Great. And then the last one I have is called Urban Native. It's a little bit longer. Um, and probably the most slammy one I have. Um, and yeah, a lot of this has to do with um, finding refuge and finding space to be myself as a native, surprisingly, in the city. How do I tell all of them, those natural, healthy, good natives, ones with the nice sunsets on their lanai, that locally grown and sourced budget, no idea what it means to have the entire breath of a city so embedded in your everyday, not even the earth can fill you when you're ripped away from it. How do I tell them that I fuck with sweet potato, but only when it's next to some cow? That cheese on toast or a bag of Doritos is sometimes what I need after a hard day. That mom and dad did the best they could, but as many days as she cooked, mom also had to come through with the happy meal because either way, I need to get fed. Will they believe me when I say that I'm decolonized? Every post or status they make having something to say about a sustainable diet, how the body is now rinsed through with sovereignty. I grew up at the bottom of the mountain, so this is the only way I know. But I was raised on the white man's sugar. Crave it. Speak mana Māori motuhake in the same breath as, yo, can we stop at the jack-in-the-box on the way home? Will they acknowledge my type of chain-breaking? See, my resistance is valid. I get restless in Kahalu'u and during the middle of the night in Glenfield. Love waking up to the sunlight, but need a couple of cars outside to complete it. So, from good to bad, on the native scale, where do I sit? Where do I get placed? Sat half-blood with no taste for vegetables or the stomach to live too far out of the city. Tell me again how much time I'm shaving off my life by choosing the taquitos at the 7-Eleven over a kale smoothie how much more connected to my heritage I would be gardening out in the Kumara patch instead of digging myself deeper into Waikiki and Chinatown's heartbeat. What do you say to each other when we aren't there? Us urban natives, the ones who never got the forest hikes growing up, hauled off for a work day in the Kalo patch, used to a Whopper and fries, but have a hard time when our own food is put on the table. Those of us who were born and brought up away from the Hokkaido, never taught our language. The cousin who watches and can't sing along, 
spent our first night on a marae at 21 and knowing that no matter what, we will always be considered some sort of incomplete, some sort of half, not enough. How much longer does it take for us to get there, to become full like you? When will my blood go from half bleach to ancestor brown, what I would give to be like centuries past? The amount of salt cemented into my face from all the crying, imagine the movie vibe I could make with it. How much of my later teenage years spent hating myself for my skin, for my diet, for the way my body reacts whenever it's surrounded by trees instead of buildings, I'm sorry. Now that I'm older, I've become less good at trying to make you like me. Wish I inherited farming and country living from my great grandparents, but I got a different survival out here on the margins. Recognize the values of growing up with family, but still hold the important lessons every adopted uncle and auntie on the corner of Lily Wokalani and Clegghorn gave me in my youth. It'd be nice to have a vegetable now and then, but. I know that what I do with my diet has nothing in common with how the rest of this body gets liberated. I like that view over the bay at my sister Noah's house, but nothing beats the blending of the city lights as I drift off to sleep, I'm afraid. My living, my native, my decolonized is something you're just gonna have to deal with. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I, I think what's so wonderful is, you know, in, in all the readings that we're getting today, we're really hearing the energy of the of the work and the life in, in the work um, in a way that you wouldn't normally see it on the page. Um, I think that's just fantastic. And I remember, um, uh, Nio, I, I remember uh, hearing you read in 2011 at MIA when it was at Fresh Cafe. Um, and it was just, I mean, it was just so amazing. My wife and I were just, uh, it was, I, it was, it was, I think the, the one thing that we, was the only thing we could talk about that night. Um, so uh, I'm glad you're, yeah, and you were able to share that. All right, uh, Doug, I move on to Doug up. Uh, decades after quitting bands, imminent riot, Patty, Judy, and the Dirt, canceling his talk show, Shaka Talk, and halting the presses on several zines, Shaka Zine, Hostage, Contraflow, Doug Up is lucky and grateful his words are recently seen in local magazines Tropic and The Manifold. In 2019, Canadian poet Amber Dawn picked up and paid Doug to be included in Arsenal Pulp's Hustling Verse, an anthology of sex workers' poetry. If the dope ain't too mean, he won't blow this and finish his latest sex worker rights uh, zine kicked. <laughs> Kaniela Ng can't know this. Please welcome Doug. Hi, thanks. I was hoping I could go first after a what I just heard, um, I guess I'll be the comic relief. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm not super prepared. My stuff is pretty short. I don't know how it fits into Kipuka, but here we go. Um, Colin, I guess I'll start with that first slide, Contra Flow. Um, yeah, I shouldn't have teased the zine in my bio because I usually don't do well on anybody's deadlines. So I didn't finish the new Kanyala Ink, can't know this. Actually, it would be issue one, but uh, here he is on the last issue of Contra Flow. And that is up on my Facebook page, Hostage Zine, H-O-S-T-A-G-E-Z-I-N-E. -E. So the whole zine's up there and it's kind of about, you might've heard the new, the, well, it's not a new term, but you might've recently heard the term turf introduced, I guess, widely by um, Mr. Chappelle, but there's also swerfs. We got swerf and turf and swerfs are sex worker, exclusionary radical feminists. So a lot of my work recently has been covering stuff like that. Uh, thanks for that slide, um, Colin. So um, I guess as a sex worker, I have to put a lot of stuff out there that, um, what you call it, trying to get some business. And so the poem that I have in the thing is a little vague. I don't, well, I kind of, I guess I look, whatever, here it goes. <laughs> I try to make it sound, Cute. And there might be a TikTok dance that could go with it, but I'm 51. I don't know how to do that stuff. So it goes, ah, it's called personal. I just want cuckoo mahu, who like hook up with you. So if you rock, 
rap, write, publish, paint, paddle, parkour, DJ, dance, design, surf, snowboard, skate. You like go on one date or what? I know one slot. I just like to look and act like one. Cause well, it's fine, cuz. So if you think so, you can whoa man handle this punky kind of funky, small kind chunky, pot junky, free mail. Send her an email with some pics of your face, dicks, and or feet. Then maybe we could meet for some sweet tricks. My treat. Oh, and like the song say. Local boys, no ka oi. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And then the next slide, I guess, sort of applies to the next one I'm going to read. Uh, thanks, Colin. Um, it's from Hustling Verse. It's a song, uh, I guess, kind of more uh, applies to the era that we're in. Um, Amber Dunn and Justin Descharm, they liked my stuff and asked me to be in it just because it was about it was comedic way of approaching things that are messed up a lot of my stuff i write representing a point of view that i don't always agree with because back in the day i'm 51 we, nobody would talk about stuff so i would have to bring up things and act like i support them to get the discussion going and stuff like that and then as time went on i realized people are on the internet and talking about this stuff and i'm not really qualified to talk about it myself but so this song is from my old band Eminent Riot in that picture. And it's, uh, it was in the Hustling verse. It's called Police Brutality. That's all. My favorite colors are blue and white. My lucky numbers are 911. So if you want to get down tonight, whip out your pepper spray and let's have some fun. Let's play police brutality, police brutality, police brutality. Police brutality, police brutality, police brutality. It's a chance to be close if you get the nerve to be just like those who protect and serve. The simple formalities become a brutal reality. So just sing with the melody and chant police brutality. Police brutality, police brutality, police brutality. Police brutality, police brutality, police brutality. It's a chance to be close. I messed up. There's no need to prove unconstitutionality. Just get into the groove and chant police brutality, police brutality, police brutality. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Sorry if you had your headphones on. Muting my mic. Thank you, Doug. I, I think it's fantastic. I mean, the, the, again, the energy, the performance. Um, I, I, Brenda, one of the the, the co-editors who's uh, in in the audience. I think every, all the all the co all the editors are in the audience today, but just funny and fierce. I think that's a fantastic way to describe it. Thank you so much. Uh, our final uh, reader today is Navid Najafi, uh, aka Old Nomadic. He is a founding member of local conscious rap collective, the Supergroupers, and a two-time Nahoku Hanuhano Hip Hop Album of the Year award winner. Born in Tehran, Iran, Najafi found home when he migrated to Hawaii after high school to attend the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Aligned with the core Hawaiian values of Aloha Aina, Najafi has become an active ally, artist, organizer, teacher, mentor, and volunteer in the community. As a native Farsi speaker, English is his second language, but discovered that music and art often operate as a universal second language. His style has activated hip hop with lyrics that explore themes of migration, culture, solidarity, and home. Navid is currently the learning programs coordinator at the Shangri-La Museum of Islamic Art, Culture, and Design in Honolulu. He is also the co-founder and an administrator artist for Sound Show. Navid? Aloha, everybody. Salam alaikum. Um, first of all, my sincere apologies for jumping on late. Um, and I'm always just so amazed by um, the poetic outpourings of, of all of, um, you know, the, the community here. And I've been so honored and, and privileged really to be in these spaces and um, hope to do it justice. I mean, I'm just a hip hop artist when it really comes down to it. 
but hip hop has been a path for me to really, um, you know, explore who I am and also the spaces that, that um, I'm in. And, um, you know, I, I'm always just blown away by, by the talent that I'm surrounded by. Um, so uh, my piece is called Grateful. And it's actually the last song on my uh, most recent album titled Second Language. And it really is kind of my, my ode of gratitude to uh, Hawaii in a sense. And, and um, so I'm just gonna perform it. I'm gonna put on the beat and, and perform it for you guys if, if that's okay for everybody. So I'm just gonna get it going here. How's that sound? You guys can hear that? Everybody hear that? Yeah. I'd like to conclude for you, Ill Nomadic 2, second language. My cauldron's got that stew, a mix of many places. My trace is very spacious. Had to be courageous, walk the path of the ageless. These sacred reflections dimmer off the stainless. When the stain sits, invisible to digest. Underneath the pressure is where raw beauty manifests. My final fantasy, the contents of my pages. The story of a child who had to wear many faces. The taste is bitter, but it helped me see the matrix. Every stranger, they learn lessons through their fakeness. Searching for that greatness didn't take it the heart, the art of having patience, put the horse before the cart. I avoid the vision, listen to my inner vision. Uh. This Nick Kurosawa. Yeah. Give me light, give me breath, I'll give you all of my love. My bad, my bad. Decisions based on lessons piling up at in the sections. I arise, find the stereos projecting it in rhythm. We are meaning musical communicative line of delivering. Yeah. This content constructed in the presence of the Ko'olaus. Cascading energy hits you in the po'o now. Serenade your cerebellum symmetry so obvious. Justice and indigenous sovereignty is synonymous. Time for this metropolis. Seek to be autonomous. No more the four for the corpse of the apocalypse. My confidence is through the roof. I'm a survivalist. Ill nomadic, supporter of anonymous, supporter of the movement to end all politics, supporter of the people who protect the sacred places. Chance to be together, it's always expanding. Yeah. Give me light, give me breath, I'll give you all of my love. Give me life, give me death, let me work my way up. Give me truth, give me honor, I'll make magic with my alchemy. Grateful for what the universe invested in me. I'm grateful for the time that you spent listening to my prose. Hope you caught my intent. And I'll close with a last thing that needs to be said. Turn your heva into pono, make gold from lead. I'm so grateful to Hawaii and Kanaka Ma Oli, showing me aloha through the sharing of their stories, teaching me a refugee of ways of their ancients to live aloha aina with respect to the sacred. Uh, yo, Otoro, we made it. It's been a long time and the people, they've been waiting. No more debating. Time to hit the pavement. Zambu Records, peace and love, we be making. Thank you, thank you. I hope that came across with the audio and the uh, the, the words and everything. But uh, yeah, and deep appreciation for all the work that everybody does. Mahalo. Well, that was fantastic. I think to have the music as well, just another element um, to the to the experience. I think what's fantastic too. I didn't realize um, that that was part of part of your music because it was actually. Uh, submitted with well sorry we don't have a, a with a a visual poem with uh, Ava Fedorov uh, called Grateful uh, that accompanies the piece so um, when you get your hands on the issue you'll be able to see uh, Navid's words along with that visual poem in, in a fantastic way and then you also have this experience here which you know further adds to that yeah, uh, so I think that's fantastic Sorry, shout out to Ava Fedorov. Um, she's an a amazing artist who, you know, she got my her hands on my album and actually painted two of the pieces, um, two of the songs as inspiration. And, and she actually includes the, the lyrics in that painting. 
um, it's kind of woven into the, the fabric of that painting. So shout out to her for sure. And, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. So we'll uh, begin the uh, talk story question and answer section. So if you do have a question, you're welcome to either use the Q&A feature with Zoom. You'll see on the bottom of your screen, a little Q&A button there, and you can type your question in that section. You're also welcome to put it directly into the chat and I, I can ask it to the uh, authors and artists as well. Um, I'd like to just start with a, a question uh, for you folks. Um, the overarching theme of this issue is finding refuge in times of change. Uh, how do you see your writing and or writing art in general, uh, music, rap, hip hop, uh, within that context? And anyone can just jump in. I guess like, I feel kind of awkward being in here is like sort of imposter syndrome or whatever with the thing. But um, I guess for my stuff, like, how I explained um, how Amber Dawn saw my stuff. I, I met her in 2013 at a uh, sex worker film and arts festival in San Francisco. And she heard me read and she was surprised that some of the stuff I was talking about was pretty heavy, but it wasn't coming across all sad and down about it. But the way I think that discussion start is more if you're like kind of break the ice and make it easy, more accessible. And I guess my approach is with humor and also to kind of let it be known that even though I want to talk about these things, I may not always know what I'm talking about or have all the information. So it's also a form of self-deprecation in a way to just like say, hi, can we talk about this? And please forgive me if I mess up, but I'm prone to doing that. So that's how I work, I guess. I will just say like kind of what I was talking about when I started my uh, reading today was just like, I feel like for me, um, refuge or like finding refuge has been like trying to um, tell these stories and these voices that I hear in my, in like from my growing up in Hawaii, like I hear, I hear the, the auntie that lived on the bus stop and by my house and I would say hi to her every morning and like, Sometimes if I had a couple extra dollars, I'd buy her coffee or something. Like I hear those, I, you know, or like the uncle that I always, who would always, he was always driving the number one bus at this certain time and I would always see him. And um, to me, like those voices are like, and those stories, like thinking about the way, like what happened with me and my sister and the things that ground us, like for me, that's been my refuge and like how I have been, able, how I try to like think about my identity and being, from Hawaii and not being from Hawaii, which I think is an important like uh, d difference to make, like being from a place, but not being as deeply tied to, to a place as other folks and people here who are expressing similar positionalities. Like, um, I think I, that's what I think about a lot. I think a lot about the, the people and the sounds and the voices that I hear, which sounds like kind of crazy, but I just mean like, I hear these stories all the time. <laughs> I kind of get what you were saying. Oh, sorry. I just remember when I was at that um, that conference in 2013, we had a writers um, thing, and then um, another girl, I think it's Serpentine Libertine, she heard my writing and she's like, "I don't believe any of it. it doesn't sound like you. None of that stuff happened." And I was like, "This is one of the true things that I'm writing about at this thing," and she totally didn't believe me. Sorry to interrupt. Thanks. Um, I'll jump in real quick. I, um, you know, this idea of refuge, I mean, it's kind of been a theme, in my life just being a, a refugee, really. And, um, you know, I left Iran at the age of eight with my family during the um, mid 80s. It was uh, at a time when, you know, political instability, but it was, there was also a war going on between Iran and Iraq. And it was one of the big reasons why, why we left. And, um, you know, we've, Ever since then, we've always been foreigners, really, in, in whatever lands that we're in. But I was really blessed to have um, parents that, that were conscious and aware of, of that, um, you know, the spaces that we occupied. And, and one of the first places we moved to was upstate New York. 
And I remember my dad being really adamant about, you know, we need to, we're always, we are visitors and we need to learn about not only the history of the place we're in, but the truth about it and to represent that. So, uh, you know, I learned about the indigenous communities in, in, in uh, the Northeast, the Mohawk, the Iroquois, uh, you know, and that was kind of always a theme in my life, just being a foreigner, and, but always taking that responsibility really seriously. And then coming to Hawaii um, as a teenager, um, you know, and when you come here, you don't know the story or the history of this place. Um, but I was also, again, very fortunate to, to some of the first friends I made were um, Native Hawaiians and, and they shared the history of not only political history of Hawaii, but also the cultural um, um, aspects of, of this place and, you know, learning from Hawaiians and learning about other Polynesian cultures and Oceania and, and and for me is honestly finding so much similarity between my own culture and, and a lot of older cultures have these kind of connections as far as, you know, family values and respecting your elders and just how to operate in a space. Um, and I've always taken that responsibility really seriously. And, and I do occupy spaces where I'm conscious of that. You know, it's like, this is not necessarily my story to tell, but it is important for me to tell my story and um, it's a part of what I do through the music education work that we do with, with Sound Shop and then now with the Shangri-La Museum is, is inspiring others to do the same, you know, and this thing that we always talk about, if you don't tell your story, then other people are going to tell it and they're not going to get it right, you know, so you are the best voice to, to speak your own truth and speak your own story and represent your people. So in a lot of what I do through my music, um, and it took me a long time to be able to actually honestly tell my own story. And that's the hardest thing to do. So uh, I'm always so inspired by people who are brave and can speak their truths unfiltered. Um, and for me, it's the legacy where, of hip hop. And even before that poetry, I mean, where I come from in Iran, Persian culture is steeped heavily in poetry, you know, for hundreds and hundred thousand years actually. And that tradition of, of saying things in a way that is truthful, unfiltered, but also clever, you know, making, uh, um, using words to paint pictures really um, is, is what I'm always striving towards. Um, I don't think, and I've been doing it a long time and I still feel like I have a lot to learn and it's a constant evolution. So um, being involved in something like this for me is, is very different than what I have done in the past, but, um, it also makes sense to, you know, based on the tradition that I kind of come from and uh, just being able to speak the truth, you know, it's the hardest thing to do is speak the truth and, and sit with that and, and, you know, take whatever comes after that step. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Niall? Um, I kind of lost track of the, so how I find, sorry, find um, refuge through art, my art. Okay. Sorry. Um, I just got hit with some tired, but um, um, yeah, I mean, I think the way that I have uh, found refuge um, through what I do through poetry specifically um i mean they're just quite plainly like there just hasn't really been any other medium than i've been, that i've been able to find that works um and it's uh like having grown up um being kind of split in two in a lot of ways being pakia being maori being american but also having this connection to you know Aotearoa and then like, you know, just so many other different types of splits um, throughout my life. Poetry has been the one place where everything can kind of come together and um, a sort of wholeness can be achieved. And um, yeah, that's a big, big point of refuge, um, being able to go there and be whole as opposed to being out in the world and kind of always being um, split up continually. Um, yeah, poetry is home for that reason and continues to provide that for me. I don't know if that made sense, but um, that's what's right there, so. 
Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Uh, we kind of have a follow-up question um, in the Q&A. We've heard your art expressed so beautifully where your refuge is in times of change. Is there anything else, uh, and this is to the whole group, uh, you would say is your refuge when so much is unstable? So beyond art or beyond your, your work, um, where do you find refuge? Uh, for me, lately, food is a big one. Um, I actually love Niall's poem about talking about Jack in the Box and like being that kind of like trash goblin that eats all these things. Also because it like reminded me of all the times that I used to take them to Jack in the Box on the way home. So that was like very, very visceral memory there, bro. But um, for me, food. So like um, I have... I feel like in some ways I've been moving further and further east. So like I started out by moving to Washington for my MFA and now I'm in Indiana, which is a really peculiar, weird place to be that I would not be unless I was doing this program. Um, and everything here is different. The grocery stores are different. The brands are different. Like the people are different. And I keep finding myself like scouring grocery stores to find like foods that feel familiar foods that feel like things that are from home and i'm like really obsessed with cooking a lot of stuff so like i've recently learned how to make i like i like why i make like i make like fried simon stir fry fried simon now i make <laughs> like um i had my parents like we like bought frozen poi from a friend and like we brought it over to Indiana. Like, you know, it's just like trying to find ways to like feel that refuge in that familiarity. I'm like best friends with all the international market, the owners of the international marketplaces here because I come like every day and I'm like, hi, hello, I'm back. Like, so that's been something that's big for me. You know, food is food is so important and critical that that reminds me of when um, my wife and I veg went vegetarian many years ago and um, trying to find you know lao lao and, and that kind of stuff and and yeah you, know, you just it's it becomes you know, somewhat impossible um, you just have to figure out ways to do that um, others um, where do you find refuge actually I'm really lucky to still have a job. Um, I work at a porn shop, <laughs> and so um, I, I've worked in porn shops for a long time, and just people have a weird perception of it that because we have viewing booths and things like that, you think there's going to be a lot of pretty sketchy people, and there is, but um, I don't think it's necessarily because of where we, well, that's part of it, I guess, <laughs> it's part of the appeal, but I also like it because it's a lot of place where people don't have privacy right now a lot of people just don't live inside anymore and so we're one of the few places where homeless people are welcome to come in and not expected to spend money. well expect to spend money but if they're going to pick a booth you know put five dollars in there spend 15 minutes or some people will throw like people that don't have money will come and throw a lot of money into this tv so they can have a room to like take their diabetic medicine or you know read and you know sleep have some place to be alone and i just really like my job a lot because uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings about people and sexuality and homelessness and drugs and all that in general and in the middle of Waikiki I see it all and so a lot of those people are welcome at my job and it just makes me feel good to hear a lot of them talk and you see them you know their lives changing sometimes for the better not always but it's really cool and luckily my bosses are really cool too and they let me do the Instagram for the job and so I'm facing my a phobia during this time because I'm really low tech, but um, them letting me play with apps on my phone all day is sort of taking my mind off all the other stress. And I feel like I'm doing something creative. And even though it's in a commercial area, it's a job and things that I would buy anyway. <laughs> so that's that. Thanks. Yeah, actually, I, I'm, I'm, I vibe with all of that. I find refu refuge in, in food for sure. Um, and I've had to learn how to cook because I grew up on Persian food and 
I don't really have that. Um, there are some ingredients that I can get from the India market we have here in Honolulu, but um, really like, and that's kind of something that I've been missing over this last, you know, uh, two years over the pandemic is, is inviting people over to have gatherings. And, and you know, I love hosting and, and having guests and cooking for people. So I've missed that, but, you know, I've had it on a much smaller scale here and there. And then just finding refuge in, in work. And I'm really, really, really fortunate to be able to be around art and artists and to think about, you know, engaging with community in, in a positive way. Um, so super blessed to have that ability um, or, you know, the ability to be in that space um, and community really, you know, um, in my friends, in, in my family, and the people that um, are important to me um, and my dog. It's definitely, sometimes I don't want to see anybody and I just want to hang out with the pup and provides great, great refuge. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'd say definitely food as well. Um, there's a, uh, um there's like two 7-elevens that i know of that sell this um meat pie that is just like how they make it back home um which is kind of amazing because i never expected ever to find that here but i go there and i get that meat pie and it makes me feel like i'm at home and that's that's always a really nice feeling um and then um, i don't talk to a lot of people uh just kind of spend a lot of time alone. So um, a big thing that I do, that's like a, a refuge thing, like a safe thing for me. Um, taking walks is really nice. That's really, really helpful. Just listening to music and walking up to UH or something. I don't like UH, um, but um, you know, the mountains and stuff are nice, so. I like being around that. Yeah. You got to give up the secret. Which 7 Eleven has the, has the dope meat pie? Oh, um, the one on University. Really? That's the other one. Yeah. Or that's the one that I go to the most. Um, yeah. Joanna, we got to send you a shipment. Yo, for real. Also, if you want to throw some sweet bread in there, I would not be mad at it. <laughs> I sweet bread truck actually recently. <laughs> Dude, I dream of sweet bread and Portuguese sausage. Like literally that is all I want in the world. <laughs> oh, all right, we're, we're about 453, 454. Uh, I think, um, Roger, do we have time for one more question or should we? Sure, <clears throat> sure, yes. Yeah, all right. Well, I, I, this uh, Tom Peake asks, uh, to any of the poets, are there any aspects of not fitting neatly into a particular tribe or place that actually give you greater strength as a human being? Yeah, actually, I talk about this a lot. Um, it's almost like being in between spaces gives you a, dif a different perspective. And not to minimize it, but an easy way for me to kind of like quantify it when I'm talking about it is almost thinking about like software programming, right? So in a lot of ways, like, uh, you know, our worldview is painted almost like a, a, a software, um, a program, you know, we all have similar hardware more or less, but it depends what software we're, we're running. So me as, you know, being multilingual and coming from, you know, uh, another culture, it's almost like having a space in between the programming to kind of be able to analyze everything. So um, there is definitely a, a point of strength on that, but you can also get lost in it in the diminishing of the, the significance and importance of certain cultural practices. And, um, you know, that's why, I, and again, it's, it's really my dad I give credit to for always being conscious and aware of that. And as an, you know, from an early age, really embedding that ideology that like you come into these spaces and you might take aspects of it, but you really have to be mindful of how you do that and, and how you honor, um, you know, these different cultures that you're, that you're learning from. Um, 
but there is, I, I believe there is a sort of advantage of, of being exposed to a lot of different um, people and, and different cultures and the in-between spaces. Um, there's a lot to be mined and discovered there. I kind of feel the same way. Um, I grew up here, I graduated Moanalua in 1988. And then from 90 to 94, I lived in Hollywood. I got really damaged and then I came back. <laughs> and I decided to put all that on everybody here and the hip hop, punk rock, God scenes and the way I dress and act and be. But as I was working out all that shit and trying to just learn and reassimilate back into Hawaii, um, I think a lot of people just, they didn't necessarily like me, but I think they respected me for just being me. Like I used to go out and just dress up in drag, but I wasn't necessarily trying to look a certain gender or even human all the time, but just figuring myself out in the way I dress and act and I would do stuff on stage. And um, I'd always go there alone and usually leave alone, but I'd make a lot of friends there just because of the things I'd say either they hadn't heard before or they wanted to say or they related to but couldn't um you know put out there and we didn't always become friends or you know even like each other after that moment but i think the fact that i would play with gender and like act like i was you know somebody that i'm obviously not would um start questions in people and if they weren't very inquisitive they would form their own opinion of me but other people i respect were respectful enough to come up to me and say, what the hell are you doing? What, what is this all about? Or they would get it and they would tell me, I understand, you know? So not fitting in anywhere, let me like kind of move amongst different spaces like a nomadic set. And it kind of helped me. And I still don't feel like I fit everywhere, but I have friends from all over the place that way because I haven't really segregated myself because I'm not welcome everywhere. <laughs> Thanks. I think I'm still renegotiating like what my relationship to these like borders are. Um, I'm working through that. And I think part of like that is me thinking about like um, my, I, I like, I think about, I think about this a lot. I ask this question, like how, like when I live, you know, in Indiana or in Washington, like I don't, I don't feel like deeply tied to these places in the way that I feel deeply tied to Hawaii. And I don't um, feel that same sense of grounding. And, I, and I'm like, how can I be so deeply tied to a place, you know, that I, that I and what does that mean? You know, what does that look like? Um, and so I'm renegotiating this a lot and I'm trying to figure out like what it means to be local and to see the world in that way that we live in Oahu, the way in Hawaii, the way we like give aloha and receive aloha and just the way that we honor our people and stories and our positionalities. And like people on the mainland don't do that all the time. And I made a lot of mistakes <laughs> just not knowing these types of things. I just see the world differently. And so I think I'm just, I'm still renegotiating where I fall and where, what that's going to look like for me. Um, but I think in one way, I am like on the borders in every single way. Like, I'm not quite a traditional poet. I'm not quite a slam poet. I don't always write like poetry. Sometimes I write prose, sometimes I write nonfiction. Now I'm studying rhetoric, uh, which is like, you know, where did that come from? But I'm not always studying rhetoric when I'm doing rhetoric. Sometimes I'm thinking about it from a poetry language area. Sometimes I'm thinking about it from a cultural studies perspective. I don't know. I can't be defined. I can't do it. Don't pin me down. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you very much, everyone. I think don't pin me down is a good mantra uh, for Kipuka. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating. Very a great variety of voices. And thank you very much. And thank you, Donald, for <clears throat> moderating. Uh, <clears throat> This will be up on the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series um, YouTube channel. Uh, if it's not up today, it'll be up there by tomorrow. And then it'll be uh, edited into a highlight video, which will be up on our website 
for at least a year. And uh, <clears throat> I will be sending messages to everyone to tell you when that happens. Okay, thank you very much. Aloha. <clears throat> thank you, everyone. Fantastic.